Namaskar, all of you, and a very warm welcome to yet another session of Bilwa. And uh, as you know, this is the concluding session of Bilwa this year. So my heart felt gratitude to all of you. You've been with us throughout this journey. Uh, most of you know by now what we are doing. But let me just briefly introduce ourselves. So I am Mauli Bariska founder and executive director of Damaru Yoga and Sound Therapy Studio. Bilva is our annual yoga festival. And every year we choose various themes appropriate to the Indian culture or the parampara, and then invite speakers to speak or conduct workshops around that topic or theme that we chose. This year, Bilva 2021, our theme is cultural appropriation of yoga, necessity to embrace the inherent Indianness of the yogic tradition. Uh, also, this festival, uh, Bilva, happens every year under the wing of Damaru Foundation. It's a Damaru Foundation is a public trust founded by Damaru Yoga and Sound Therapy Studio, with the aim to promote and implement the traditional yogic sciences in the current times and increase awareness about wellness and harmony in the society while primarily focusing on serving that segment of our society who are in dire need of support for their holistic well-being but uh, may not be able to afford it. Contributions to Damru Foundation are used towards various activities that focus on physical, mental, emotional well-being of individuals and groups, schools, communities, etc. So if you wish to support our efforts, consider contributing to the Damru Foundation either by making a one-time payment or a recurring mode of payments. You can find the link to the payment in our uh, uh, description box in the video below. Your contributions will help us together support more people in the society as well as bring about more such valuable content and speakers to share their knowledge with us. So as we are, we have been on this journey through the whole month, we dealt into the misappropriation of yoga or maybe how to bring about the appropriation in the yogic practices and uh, different speakers touched upon various points and facets or lenses through which we could see this whole and it's a very important topic so a very rich uh, discussion has emerged over this last month and our today's speaker um, She's going to talk about yoga dharma, when yoga looks within. So while we looked on all the facets around, now it is time to look within. So before I uh, introduce you to her, let me welcome her to the live. Namaste. Namaste, Anuradha ji. A very warm welcome to Damru and to Bilba. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. I'm just so glad to have you and especially with the topic that just creates a full circle to the whole range of discussions that have been happening. Uh, before I give the session to you, uh, for our viewers, let me just uh, give a brief introduction about uh, Anuradha Ji. Dr. Anuradha Chaudhary is presently a faculty of uh, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kharagpur, and a member of Reiki Center of Excellence for Science and Happy Science of Happiness. She teaches Sanskrit and Heritage, Indian Psychology, French, History of Science and Technology in Ancient India. After graduating from uh, Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education, she went on to get her PhD in Sanskrit on Vedic psychology from uh, Pondicherry University and was awarded the Erasmus Mundus Scholarship of the EU for an MLit in Crossways in European Humanities. She also received a UN-related scholarship for a course on human rights at the Summer University of Human Rights, Geneva. She worked on the Indian concepts of happiness 
and i think you also have a book on it it will follow uh, concepts of happiness as a, a fellow at the development foundation bangalore and established the center of indian psychology jain university bangalore which uh, sought to establish an alternative paradigm for psychology based on indic world view she is also an online instructor of uh, yogaanytime.com and nptel as a resource person for teaching spoken sanskrit yoga psychology and about transformative power of mantras besides this she has done uh, besides this she has done sessions for orville international netherlands the school of practical psychology and economic sciences in uk ireland australia ojai yoga crib usa theosophical society ojai b valley uh, the european union of yoga zinal there along with uh, dr vinay chandra she was invited as the guest of honor together they teach at several other academic institutions and other organizations across the globe furthermore they have founded the ritambara yogashala co-edited a book titled perspectives on indian psychology and also co-authored another title happiness indian perspectives this is a very beautiful book in 2019 she received the excellent yoga teachers award at iit kharagpur and uh, she has been organizing the 41 days online yoga thon called the global festival of yoga celebrating wellness for indica yoga in 2020 as well as 2021 and it recently concluded in mid july like we were talking yesterday uh, it hosted around 124 yoga teachers practitioners researchers etc worldwide reaching out to over 50 countries and like i said yesterday i again urge you all to really explore the indica yoga channel wonderful uh, speakers and beautiful talks enriching knowledge sessions are there so you may all visit there but for today anura ji a very warm welcome once again and uh, thank you for accepting the invite and choosing this beautiful topic thank you very much mauli ji and uh, for giving me this opportunity and i think it's a real privilege to get to close this uh, marvelous event which has been an eye opener for many um, with such uh, esteemed teachers scholars practitioners so i'll try my own i'll try my level best to uh, add another dimension to this which i hope will be will only contribute towards enriching the topic more for all our uh listeners from across the world uh it has been extremely uh enlightening for me also to listen to dr vinay chandra yesterday uh he did a brilliant presentation on the topic of uh, how yoga modern research and all are appropriating trying to appropriate or misappropriate yoga and um, i think there was a lot to learn for many practitioners of yoga about the other side that one doesn't necessarily see when one is a yoga practitioner So uh, thank you very much once again for this opportunity. You did it so wonderfully and the way you structured the session it was putting things out but with so much of compassion so it is amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Really like it. <laughs> yes. So um I'd like to start but I'd like to start if with your permission I'll start by showing my PPT. but just before i launch just a small uh, pranam and a small invocation and then i will go ahead with my topic so thank you very much once again om shri guru bhyo namaha hari hi om ओम शन्नो मित्र शंवरुण शन्नो भवत्म शन्न इंद्रो बृहस्पति शन्नो विष्णुरुक्रम नमो ब्रह्मणे नमस्ते वायो वायुमेव प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्मासी वामेव प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्म वदिष्या ऋत वदिष्या सत्यं वदिष्या तन्मावतु 
तदक्तावतु अवतु मवतु वक्ता ओ शांति 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 So I'll just try to share my screen, and I hope it works again. So the topic of my presentation today is yoga dharma. when yoga looks within so with yesterday's presentation of dr vinay chandra all of you would have understood about the different ways in which uh, people or different groups are trying to claim yoga and trying to remove it a little bit from its essence one of the ways in which we can counter that very effectively is to dive deep into what yoga really is so there are two ways of uh, countering such movements one is that either we try to uh, you know confront them and try and present them with every case that they have which is in terms of trying to appropriate or misappropriate yoga we try and present a counterpoint to say no you see this is what it originally is and the other approach to it is just to be so true and so sincere to just be that shining light of what yoga is to be a living representative of what that tradition represents Uh, which can help to then allow the rest who are other than that to uh, or you know the other world to be able to make out the what is true and what is not true so what i felt uh, would be uh, in place in keeping with the topic today is to dive once more into the the deeper understanding of what yoga really is all about and that's why i called my presentation the yoga dharma when yoga looks within and try and understand what this culture is trying to represent what are these practices that have emerged from there and so the theme as we ha as molly ji has been talking about it and all our other speakers is about cultural appropriation of yoga and the necessity to embrace the inherent indianness of the yogic tradition uh being a sanskrit is one of the tendencies i have when i um, uh, take up a topic is to look at the words and see what do these words really reveal to us and so the first thing that i would try and address in this topic is to try and understand what the indianness of yoga tradition is and in this context yesterday vinay talk, vinay ji talked to us about you know the bhranti darshana so basing himself in the framework of the yoga sutras he's talked about what bhranti darshana was in the presentation of yoga today in today's world so i thought of talking about the what yoga darshana is all about and when we talk of yoga darshana i'm not talking of the philosophy of yoga in terms of you know the six uh, classical systems of philosophy or the schools of philosophy i imply by yoga darshana the yogic world view every system of practice every system of um, a psychology of philosophy is founded on a certain way of looking at life and if one is not true to that way of looking at life then by default one is not really uh, following that particular philosophy or that particular path no matter what one's claims might be so i thought of really focusing and highlighting on uh, the essential features of what we mean by the yogic tradition so the first topic that i will be talk addressing is about yoga darshana versus the bhranti darshana so what's the yogic world view the second thing would be the topic of my uh, presentation which is yoga dharma versus yoga adharma or if you put it together it becomes yoga dharma and the third is i thought of looking at yoga as a yoga purusha itself so just as in the yoga sutra when we are talking of the individual as having certain shortcomings and the goals of the individual in the yoga tradition i thought of looking at yoga itself as uh, a yoga purusha so all these different efforts of yoga 
as the yoga being that is trying to evolve that is manifesting itself on earth con- in the earth's consciousness and therefore what would yoga swarupa be versus the yoga sarupya so i just i i said let me try and present these topics in a slightly different manner and i uh, love to hear what all of you have to think about it and understand from it so shri aurobindo has this fantastic saying where he says that one might almost say that ancient india was created by the veda and upanishads and that the visions of inspired seers made a people so this was the seed of indian civilization and therefore it becomes important for us to trace whatever followed in the indic uh, civilizational outpouring after that back to the vedas and see what is it that the vedas are really talking about and so we have the word veda coming from the root vid and the root vid largely has three kinds of connotations so the word verb vid can mean to know to be and to obtain and therefore the vedas are really talking about a knowledge to be obtained on what to be and therefore what is this yoga darshana what is the vedic world view that underlies all of the indic psyche really and also all the practices like yoga etc that emerge from there so i thought of engaging a little bit in the first principle questioning method with certain essential questions one of the things that our ancestors our forefathers figured out very early is uh, that when you're looking at wor- at the world there are many things that we are not able to make full sense of because what we are looking at is basically mediated through the limitations of our own sensorial perceptions and so their foundation question was is it to what extent can we uh, can we clean up our lenses of perception so that one arrives at a genuine and authentic knowledge of oneself and of the world around themselves so the first question that the entire yogic principle founded itself was and that's the key pin of any uh, irrespective of the stream of yoga that one follows the question that ramana maharshi put forth to every single disciple who came to him was this he said ko hum find out who am i because once we had clarity once one can have clarity about the person who is undergoing this journey of life that would then give rise to how one undertakes that journey itself so as i was saying that uh, life happens to most of us when we step into the on the path of yoga then one starts making life worth living so that is a very important step and the very first question that one would have to address there is who am i and like many of you would already be familiar with the answers that our ancestors and the rishis arrived at they said that essentially i am that so hum that i am or in different words aham brahmasmi this answer did not arrive you know just within a certain moment like that it took years of contemplation so when yoga uh, when vinay ji yesterday was talking about the fact that um, there are programs of 200 uh, 200 hours or just 20 days and you become a yoga teacher uh, it really asks us some or it requires us to ask these fundamental questions as to what what aspect of yoga am i really touching if i am only going through a 200 hours of yoga training or i'm just doing a 20 day to what extent have i started having a better understanding of myself in order to be able to impart something meaningful to those i am engaging with or those who i'm aspiring to teach i will not say that there is any ill will in that uh, in that intention but uh, there is a requirement for a certain sincerity of asking oneself to what extent we have been able to touch even to a certain minimum degree the spirit of what yoga expects of us to be able to hand over something of authentic or, or with certain degree of authenticity to our um, students around us so soham was one of those first realizations that our rishis arrived at but in order to arrive at that they also realized that life is a multi-layered uh, truth that there are various dimensions that we are made of so when we talk of the yoga tradition and whatever that practices does not take us beyond the mat it does it is not taking us beyond the simplistic 
interpretation of yoga as beyond asanas or just beyond certain exercises not even asanas in terms of understanding the fact that when you put your body in a certain posture the breath or the prana is moved in a certain manner when that breath is moved in us in a certain manner the blockages within that might have arisen due to psychological issues life experiences mental constrictions uh, physical incapacities all of these cause certain blockages within the system and when i'm just putting my body in a certain posture the way the air or the prana is moved within the system will help to unblock those uh, those particular blockages that might have happened due to the various uh, diseases of our lifestyle that we are undergoing today so the very first investigation into the question who am i should allow the uh, the explorer of the yogic path to recognize that life is not two dimensional life is multi is simultaneously coexisting multi dimensional realities and if one makes a change on one dimension it can have an effect on another dimension you make a change so i change my body i can open up my mind i change the way my mind is functioning my body becomes more flexible so all these dimensions are interrelated and that becomes very important to acknowledge first and foremost at the backdrop of any further exploration that one might do with yoga so if that has not clicked in in your personal in one's personal practice of yoga then it should raise the question of whether one is really on the path of yoga or one is claiming to uh, do a practice that sounds like yoga but which doesn't really touch the spirit of that practice the second question that was very important for the yoga for the rishis at that point was what is the purpose of my existence because they fathomed again very early that life seems to be bound between two points of birth and death and no matter what you seem to accumulate during that lifetime no matter how much you have at the end of that account it all seems to come to naught so therefore what really would be the purpose of striving so hard during that one lifetime if everything eventually amounts to zero and this is also one of the main questions that comes up in the kathopanishad in many of the upanishadic texts in fact this question does arise and in the kathopanishad this little boy nachiketa is asking the lord of death he says you know that we do so much and all and yet we die what is what is there beyond it if there is nothing beyond it then why what do we strive for so much during this lifetime so when uh, when addressing this particular question the rishis or the seers they divided or they classified life into four parts they said you know uh, uh, people are trying to aspire for four things largely in life which they call the purusharthas so they said first we have the uh, we are all trying to understand what dharma is secondly we all have necessities we all have material requirements which is artha we all have uh, desires which is karma but then they said that no matter how much wealth you have how many desires you are able to fulfill or not fulfill both the acquisition of wealth and the pursuit of desire has to be founded on the concept of dharma which is understanding the right measure of things this is when you understand that then you will be able to engage with wealth and with desires in a manner that is most fulfilling for oneself and the goal beyond that is to be able to find moksha but the definition of moksha here is not about a uh, renunciation in terms of letting everything go and going off to the forest or going off to the mountain the attempt of moksha here as the vedas represent it is not something which is other worldly but within this world itself so the idea was how can we act within this world without uh, allowing the world to leave its imprints on us can we live through the world by being like a lotus petal where there are drops of water that can fall on it but the lotus leaf is itself not affected by the drops of water that come into it and when one can lead life in that manner then life really becomes or rather one can lead life to one's fullest extent because then one is not uh, limited by the lack of anything both the artha and karma 
give to us a sensation of a lack within ourselves it is because we try to fulfill or because we experience a certain amount of absence within that we seek to complete it by having more in terms of wealth having more in terms of satisfactions of one's senses satisfactions of one's desires etc the very idea of moksha as a possible or rather as a as the desirable goal of life presented us the possibility of focusing our life on who we become through the pursuit of wealth and through the pursuit of desires and who do we become in terms of how complete do i become rather than how empty i become so as we choose our path of yoga what becomes important to understand at the basis of that choice is is the practice is my personal practice making me experience greater sense of completeness a greater sense of in a sense independence within myself or is it making me more attached more attached to the practice in a sense more attached to the teacher more attached to the thing uh, more attached to all the you know the kind of yoga mat i use sorry the kind of yoga mat i use the kind of yoga dress i wear uh, the yoga crowd i hang out with so is my practice making me more attached to even what i claim to be the yoga yoga path or is it allowing me to engage in these fully enjoy them for what they are and yet at the same time not become not feel that one is any less if one is not uh, doing any of what one believes is absolutely important so this idea of moksha the purpose of existence was how do we lead life like a lotus petal or a lotus leaf that engage in everything engage like the, the lotus flower actually is a very beautiful example of this uh, idea of uh, moksha in life because it grows in the muck and yet it is not affected by the dirt that surrounds it its uh, lotus petals or rather the lotus leaf uh, is is touching water all the time water is falling on it and yet it remains unaffected by that so any kind of yoga that is not connecting us to that nature of yoga or that quality of yoga is by that very fact a misappropriation of yoga in a certain sense so these are all certain pointers that help us to know for oneself these are all like i would say litmus test for oneself of whether the path that one is choosing or whether what is being presented of as yoga is really doing justice to the essential features of what the yogic tradition aims at achieving for the individual and the third and very important idea was what is my relationship with the world around me and the answer to that was the realization of ekatvam or that essential oneness with everything so coming back again to how our yoga practice uh, is or rather what our yoga practice is revealing to us is our yoga practice making us feel more unique in the sense of more fragile in one's ego essential nature in which case whatever practice it might be is missing the point because it is not or rather it is making us so independent in terms of um, a rigid identity that it would then not allow us to connect with the essential truth of the yoga which says that there is this oneness which underlies everything so in the isha upanishad very beautifully also they say yas tu sarvani bhutani atman yevanu pashyati one who can see everything all the world in oneself sarva bhuteshu chatmanam in everything they see oneself tato navik jugupsate so once that kind of a unity or a oneness is experienced there is no kind of repulsion from anything there is no kind of uh, distaste for anything so the question that one needs to ask oneself is whether the practice that one is engaging in is it a practice that is helping me to feel more a harmony with myself more harmony with everything around me or is it a practice that is making me uh, that is making me if i can put it making me a little restless 
in in my preferences my dislikes etc so if one is un one understands these three qualities at least or these three aspects of the yogic tradition then one would be prescribing to a certain sense to the world a vedic world view but how do we arrive at this and yoga is uh, one of those paths that is being prescribed but yoga has got various streams and it has been limited in certain senses to certain particular certain practices at times but yoga in itself as all of you would already be familiar comes from the root yuj which means uh, to unite with oneself and therefore it is a kind of an alignment and it is a dissolution of one's limited self into that vaster truth of the vedas but if i would like to elaborate this to you a little further i'd like to show the connection of the yogic world view with the larger vedic understanding of how the individual connects to the forces of the cosmos around oneself and for this i'd have to take you to the idea of what is this yoga dharma what is this yogic ideal and the yogic ideal can be built from the idea of the vedic triad which is the notions of satyam pratham and brihat in my uh, little experience of the yogic world view or the yogic way of life i find that this triad of satyam ritam brihat really helps to summarize or rather to act as a framework that helps us understand a lot of what life is all about so when they are saying satyam it goes to say that essentially there is a certain truth which when creation happened it chose to manifest itself in a perfection of existence so at the basis of all of creation there is an ideal there is the perfect world and that perfect world is what one understands as satyam but then we know through our own experience of life that while we are aware of ideals it is not always easy to implement them in one's life's journey that ability to implement it in action the right or the dynamic truth in action is what is meant by ritam the very idea of the right implies necessarily that there is a standard again which against which one is talking of the right and therefore this rightness represents is referring back to that satya so there is an ideal there is a need to implement that ideal and when one implements that ideal then the natural consequence is the brihat or the vast and which is also sukha or excellent spaces so the question is when we are talking of yoga dharma so when we conceive of what yoga really is what what are we really talking about we've mentioned a few points earlier but i'd like you to i'd like to take you back to the source of these thoughts in the vedas themselves and so we come to we arrive at the doctrine of the mystics so this is an idea that i have got from sri aurobindo's interpretation of the vedas in his book the secret of the vedas so there he says that the vedic rishis in their quests of understanding the absolute of things of understanding the truth of their own nature of trying to understand at that authentic reality that is behind everything they arrived at certain doctrines the first one was the idea that man the way the individual is form, formed or the way the man is is characterized by a lot of imperfections at all levels at the level of the body there are imperfections at the level of the emotions there are imperfections at the level of the thoughts there are imperfections at the level of even beyond there are possible in the whole of it has a lot of imperfections but talking of the purpose of life they said that our life is taking us towards our perfection if we choose to understand and follow that path so there is imperfection but there is a potential perfection underlying all of that the second is that every individual is formatted differently and therefore there are many paths to arrive at that truth there is no singular homogeneous way of saying that that is the only way to do things and therefore it is left to every individual to discover their own path leading to swar which also means the inner truth and that path is a part of the right i think the crux of a lot of this vedic truth 
is the discovery of this right of things. And therefore, in the Yoga Sutras also, uh, Patanjali says that the highest kind of intelligence that one can have is the Ritam Bhara Prajna. How does one find the right of things? How does one not just find the right in larger contexts of life, but how does one discover that right in the smaller details of one's life? And if one is able to find that, one will discover that things seem to flow as if it is the best that thing that, that could have happened. And so the second doctrine that Sri Aurobindo talks about is that one has to find the each individual has to discover their own truth, their own right, and follow that with all sincerity. The third doctrine that they talked about was the fact that there is one truth which has many names. And I think, again, this is a very defining feature of the yogic tradition, that there is never this emphasis on the uh, singular approach to things. There are multiple approaches, and none of the approaches are exclusive to each other. These approaches can be, in, or rather, require to be inclusive at some point of the or the other. If one is working on the, if one is working on karma yoga, one will invariably arrive at a point where one is uh, also needs to offer one's work to the divine forces, and that is the aspect of bhakti. If one is working on bhakti yoga, one cannot do it without a certain understanding of the the greater truth of jnana. So there has to be a a collaboration or not a collaboration but a certain synthesis of all the parts and it is when one is working with that synthesized consciousness that one is able to appreciate the true spirit once more of the yoga tradition so in the vedas the the foundational ideas were these that there is a truth that needs to be discovered where we can arrive at a state of being whatever the path might be of discovering that that wow within oneself, that, that alignment. So if the body is there, if each one of us has a body, we can find the right state of physical health that will then prevent us from experiencing disease and old age and death. At the emotional level, there is a way of feeling an emotion that is beyond the regular transactional emotions that we have in life, which it is also important to recognize is that the more we engage in transactional relationships, the more there is a kind of a wear and tear that happens. So how do we relate with one another without entering into a mode of a transactional uh, nature, which is detrimental to one's own fullness? So one can engage with uh, relationships that enhance one's fullness rather than cause the, uh, the, the experience of want in the absence of the other. So a lot of beautiful possibilities that emerge when one starts understanding the spirit of what this yoga dharma is all about. And then when we enter into the mental space, so what are those ways of knowing life? What are those ways of engaging with life that allow us to see the, see the part as one aspect of the fullness of things? Can we look at life not just through our fragmented realities, but look at life through the through a larger, uh, I won't say prism, but a larger faculty of looking at or appreciating the importance of the part within the larger context of the whole, and this can then enlighten our intelligence and take us further on the path that one is walking. The fourth doctrine that Sri Aurobindo talks of is in terms of images, because the entire Vedic text is full of imagery. So it says that. Life is a battle. There are forces of light and there are forces of darkness. If I have to bring this in terms of a more concrete uh, idea, or a concept in our own lives, our life can be summarized in terms of two games that we play. The first game is, are we playing a game that is helping us go towards expansion? Any force that takes us towards expansion, any word that takes us to our expansion, any thought that takes us to our expansion is a battle that we're fighting on the side of the devas or those enlightened beings within us and without us. If we are making a decision that is contracting us, that is making us smaller in terms of words, in terms of thoughts, in terms of actions, then we are working towards the, or rather we are fighting on the side of the, of the dasyus or those forces of division. 
the other one is the sacrifice are we what are we offering our time our resources our energies to are we offering them to become greater than ourselves or are we offering to become smaller than ourselves and the third is the idea of a journey so life is a journey and we are whether we like it or not we are taking steps on those journeys that are either aligning us with ourselves which is the real path of yoga or which is taking us away from our own alignments so what step are we making with every every at every moment of our lives is a question that we need to ask ourselves and therefore i talked about this idea of the battle which is between the devas those forces of light that seek to guide us towards our immortality and the forces of darkness that obstruct us from reaching that goal so where are we fighting that battle and in the vedas they have this very beautiful idea that the human being is has a rare privilege of receiving this choice or being or rather being empowered by this choice and they say that even the gods choose to become choose to have a human birth if they want to transcend their godhead so the human being has the capacity of choosing very consciously which side of the battle they want to find and therefore becoming greater than oneself and discovering that larger oneness which is that spirit of the brahma within oneself the second idea is that of the sacrifice that i spoke of that all of life is a conscious inner offering to the higher forces in us to agni the divine will in man and therefore when we talk of yoga and we are talking of finding the right guru the vedas tells us that there is within each one of us that there is the flame that knows the purpose of that individual's existence and that flame within is what is the 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 agni the cosmic agni of the vedas and they very beautifully use the epithet jat vedas so that flame within us knows the purpose of its birth and if one knows how to connect with that flame within then one will can have an external guru but one is not bound by the teachings of an external guru either because one is able to connect to the truth within and follow that in order to arrive at the destination of one's oneness one's dissolution that yoga provides us and therefore what really is the sacrifice so very uh, symbolically the very ritual of the yajna is telling us that at every moment we are consciously or unconsciously giving our thoughts to something or the other so are we giving our thoughts again to the gods or are we giving our thoughts to the dasyus are we offering our thoughts to vastness or are we offering our thoughts to narrowness are we offering our thoughts to light or are we offering our thoughts to darkness and i'm starting with thoughts because everything else flows from there our thoughts our speech our actions all start with the seed that we are of making our offering to and what do they say at that point of the symbolism of the sacrifice they say we need to light that fire so if one wants to truly do yoga then one one has to light that fire that will then kindle clarity so how do we keep that fire burning we have to add that ghrita or that the ghee that you add to the fire which is our clarified thoughts so the more one wants to pursue one's journey of yoga in the best way possible the more one has to have clarity one has to have the viveka that uh, discriminatory or discretionary intelligence of what is it that is right for me what is it that is uh, shreyas or that which is good for one's life and what is it that is pleasurable so in terms of also a yoga practice do i do i choose a yoga practice that feels good in terms of it's easy it it is a company that doesn't push me beyond my comfort zones or is it a company that is inviting me to challenge myself it is a company that is inviting me to question my limitations uh do the friends ask me to do that is the practice pushing me the more the practice is pushing us to exceed or transcend our own barriers of uh, uh, beyond our comfort zones the more one is working towards one's greater light and one is doing the sacrifice in a manner that will help us discover who we really are in terms of the larger truth and light within oneself so uh 
these uh, the sacrifice is another very important idea of the vedas that we are all engaging in this process so there is never an opportunity to say that uh, let me just let me just take it easy this taking it easy is in yoga a few steps back and therefore the demand of yoga dharma is to what extent can we really hold ourselves to what extent are we able to uphold that ideal there are many of us who also claim to be on that path and we are walking on that path but if we are not doing that uh with that kind of a sincerity then i think the question becomes very valid for every single practitioner of yoga as to what really are we then claiming to do are we really following that practice that we are claiming to follow or are we doing something pretending to follow a path but doing it because it has other kind of benefits which uh, don't allow us to necessarily not uh, you know they don't allow us to necessarily may ask those hard questions so this is a very important idea of the vedic sacrifice that is there the vedic yajna or the offering the third idea is like i mentioned that we are in any case on the move we are not just on the move in this lifetime but the word vedic world view or the the world view of the yoga darshana makes us rec recognize that this journey did not be begin when our story on earth began with the entry in this lifetime and the story will neither close when we have closed our account in this lifetime with these particular forms that the journey will continue that we are on this journey and we are continuing to move ahead and therefore where are we stepping what are we doing what are we choosing to do in life is what becomes very important and the last point that i wanted to bring forth is this idea of the swarupa of yoga and the yoga purusha so i thought of uh, talking of yoga as the as a yoga purusha in itself <clears throat> and again use the framework of the yoga dash yoga sutras that vinay chandra ji used yesterday to say that what is yoga really so yoga is yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha so when we look at this whole movement if you look at the movement of yoga is the is the discussions on yoga increasing the noise around the yoga practice or are the practices of yoga helping us to align in harmony is it is are the discussions that we are having academically are they aligning us more with the true spirit of yoga or are they seeking to create more conflicts even at the level of the discussions that they are having the level of the concepts that are being presented and so the question is what is the yoga swarupa and in the yoga purusha so the question is can we find the drashta of the yoga tradition itself and in order to find the drashta of the yoga tradition one has to be able to distinguish between the different kinds of movements that are taking place and uh, this particular festival has helped us to i think in many different ways understand these different distractions of the so called yogic practices that are creating more noise within the system rather than helping us to quieten that noise and connect with ourselves so the vrittis that are happening the different movements of thought of practice are they practices that are klishta <coughs> that are complex in their formulations that are uh, that are <coughs> not in alignment in themselves or are they a klishta where the, there is so much of clarity in terms of the presentation of the yogic thing with the yogic philosophy with the yogic practice helping us to connect not just with ourselves but also with the society around so what really is the what really is the path that one chooses on in yoga helping us to achieve in terms of the larger yoga purusha is also a question that we can ask ourselves and therefore one understands that the yoga purusha also has certain inputs like the yoga practice every yoga practice is based on the understanding that as a human being we have inputs we have a certain processing that takes place and we have certain outputs so the very first definition of yoga it says that 
तम योगम इति मन्यन्ते स्थिराम इंद्रिय धारणा सो आर आवर सेंसेस सो द योग प्रैक्टिसेस दैट वी आर अडॉप्टिंग आर दे आर दे मेकिंग अस सेंसोरियली मोर अटैच टू द योग टू द ऑब्जेक्ट्स अराउंड देम और आर दे हेल्पिंग अस टू टर्न आवर सेंसेस एंड फोकस ऑन द डीपर ट्रूथ विद इन अस सो व्हाट इज द योग प्रैक्टिस वन एंगेजिंग इन अलाउइंग अस टू डू what is it doing to us at our sensorial level will be again a first uh, test to help us understand whether the choice that we have made is in line with the larger yoga dharma or it is in line with the adharma in terms of the fact that it takes us away from that truth within ourselves so the first definition is about helping us observe the inputs into the system so the yoga practice therefore what is it doing to us at that level the second one is in terms of the processor so it helps us to process manage the system within us and that's where you have the definition of yoga chitta vritti nirodha so the yoga practice that we are engaging in is it a practice that is increasing the doubts within us is it a practice that is increasing the noise in terms of questioning our Uh, our bhakti is it questioning our uh, our our ideas about what yoga is really aiming at is it seeking to bring harmony within oneself is it seeking to to bind ideas to help us see the connection that is there behind the different concepts that are presented to us or is it one that is putting everything at loggerheads with itself because the moment there is a yoga practice or a concept within that that is being presented that is opposing in serious conflict with the other one has to ask oneself whether that practice what is the intention underlying that practice and whether that intention is helping us connect again with our deeper self whether again that intention is on the side of the devas that intention is on the side of the dasyus one needs to again ask oneself how is one really processing this within ourselves and in terms of the yoga purusha also i think this particular idea of chitta vritti nirodha so how are we dealing with the differences that are arising in terms of the kind of attempts at appropriation also how are we as practitioners of yoga dealing with them are we allowing those practices to disturb us completely out of our balance or have we been able to find that balance that is able to to be able to understand that other the opposing position and yet be able to have the compassion uh, what vinayji also talked about yesterday that ekatvam to be able to have that compassion the maitri and karuna bhava to be able to accept them and to say that okay that is one aspect and we need to find that common synthesis in order to advance on the path and the final aspect of this uh, the yoga the system and the output is the definition that we find in the bhagavad gita which is yoga karma su kaushalam so whatever practice that one takes on is it a practice that is helping us achieve greater degrees of truth right and perfection at the level of our thoughts at the level of our speech at the level of our actions if whatever practice one is undertaking is not aligning itself to this inherent kaushalam or this inherent skill uh, that is another important feature of the yogic practice then it is something that one needs to question whether it is really uh, in line and in spirit with the larger uh, essence of the yoga tradition so the yoga karma su kaushalam is the uh, is there again a, an important litmus to help us understand whether our practice is uh, taking us towards that perfection or is it something which is uh, not pressing us towards trying to achieve that in one's way of living life in with in what one is doing the other important definition of yoga is the idea of the Yo, samatvam yoga uchyate so whatever the practice of yoga one might have is is the practice of yoga that we are doing helping us achieve a greater degree of balance a greater degree of um vairagya 
uh, that uh, the Yoga Sutras talks about and many other yoga traditions. So is that yoga tradition, uh, yoga practice that one is adopting, is it allowing us to find a greater degree of connect within and a greater degree of balance with uh, whatever one is doing? If that is so, then one knows that one is being sincere, or rather one is being able to uphold the yoga dharma in one's uh, in one's own practice, personal journey. And therefore, one of the ways of uh, understanding this bra the concept of Brahma also is, uh, and that is also what I think is the real goal of the yoga tradition, is to help us being real <clears throat> or reconnected after hearing the mantra of the national Atman or of the Atman itself. So when I talk of national, it's also because when we talked of Indianness at the beginning, we all, we belong to different regions, we belong to different communities, we belong to different, even faiths. But if we claim to be Indians, do we really understand what India is all about? And do we really understand what the worldview is that underlies this entire philosophy of life? What is it that has shaped the Indian psyche? And if one understands all of that, then it would also help us to understand that which is not in line with this. So one way, uh, coming back a full circle with what we started, one, one effective way as yoga practitioners to, under, uh, to understand or to recognize attempts to appropriate yoga or misappropriate yoga is to have greater and greater clarity about what really yoga is. The more one is able to not just conceptually understand yoga, not just have the satya in terms of, yes, that is what yoga is all about. But if one is able to bring that down into one's practice and implement that in terms of the ritha of the right thing to do in our own paths, and one will automatically experience what the yoga tradition promises us, which is uh, the, the path of moksha, which is freedom and fullness of experience and the purnata. So the yogic uh, approach that leads us towards our fullness is that approach which upholds the yoga dharma in its best way possible. And with these few words, I'd like to end with this call of the Vedic uh, rishis, which was Amritasya Putraha. Because it is important to also understand that when one is able to align oneself with the truth of the things, with the right, then there is the least friction in whatever one does. The corrosion that happens from corruption of the values we hold and the gap in its implementation is what hastens decay and death in one's life experience. So the more one is able to align oneself to yoga dharma by looking at what the call of yoga is at the level of the individual, at the level of the organization, at the level of the nation, at the level of uh, a global practice of yoga, the more we would be stepping up on this journey of yoga, on this journey of life, towards one's own immortality in a certain sense. And uh, another call that the Vedic Rishis had was of Krinvantu Vishwam Aryam, make of the whole world Aryans. And what did they mean by Aryan? It's another word that we need to uh, we need to uh, resurrect in a certain sense because it has been abused uh, by Hitler and others. So the concept of Aryan was the idea of the fighter, the idea of the warrior, the idea of the cultivator, one who was ready to fight one's own limitations, one who was ready to fight the battle on the side of the devas. And on the other hand, the Aryan coming from the root Ar to cultivate was one who was ready to sow the seeds of immortality within oneself. So the more one is able to sow this in oneself, the more one is ready to fight on the side of light and truth, the more one lives up to the Aryan within oneself. And the Vedas in the true spirit, because those who practice yoga and have the apprehensions of, you know, this is a this is a Hindu thing, this is a, we are getting... Um, converted into a certain philosophy of life, if one understands what the real concept of the Aryan is, uh, will be inspired to understand that this was a call to all of humanity. The very vision of the Vedas 
was not ever about fragments of society here and there or communities of people here and there or cultures here and there the very idea of the vedas which uh, of the vedic aryan which finds its root no doubt in the in the on the on the soil of the uh, indian subcontinent was the idea of the fact that we are all one human race we are all one humanity and can we come together it's high time that we come together overlook our differences and work towards our collective well being we have to rather than always finding conflict difference and focus on that can we turn back towards that yoga swarupa the, the essential quality of yoga which is that alignment within that alignment without with everything that is irrespective of the apparent apparent differences and uh, connect finally to that or dissolve one's uh, dissolve one's limited concepts of who we are one needs to celebrate the diversity of who one is but not get rigid about the limited concept of that alone being one manifestation of that truth so the call of the vedas again which says that there is one truth which has many forms and it is important for every individual to find that right which is true to their form true to their being and follow that uh, towards their own immortality in its own way With these words thank you very much bahut dhanyawad aha and shubham astu may well being be yours thank you so mauli ji thank you very much i'm glad i did thank you Thank you. Uh, like you said, uh, from somewhere we have to start from sowing the seeds of immortality within us. But something struck me, uh, which was again very important, was that we learn this, study these values, but the distance that we create between the actual application of them and the knowledge base of them, that gap should be bridged. And uh, Uh, actually when i was listening to you it was so engrossed and it was so uh, structured in a way that self uh, the topics were rolling one and another and but but uh, we have a lot of questions i i was actually was thinking that oh this is self explanatory and this is going so well but we have a lot of questions today so if you are okay we can take some more sure time. sure 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 uh genia mukherjee she has a question how to weave a composite story or carve out the up the, from storylines that dot the yogic tradition could you just repeat that again please yeah. to <laughs> how to weave a composite story or carve out the after from storylines that dot the yogic tradition yes so i think the if i have understood it the question correctly that when one is when when one one has to choose one's path of yoga there are many claims to authenticity of yoga so there are many voices that claim to be so even in this uh, in the academic discussions if one is not uh, if one is a uh, is a scholar then one can get misled by a lot of claims of these interpretations of yoga as being authentic so how does one know what is authentic and what is not authentic and i think that the the touchstone or the last the the bottom line of the yoga tradition is experience in itself so if one's practice at the end of the day it is not about what one knows or what one claims or what one is you know telling the others to do the bottom line of this is what is what who is one and what is one doing at the end of the day and that's why i spent a lot in the first part of it where i was saying that it's not enough to just make certain claims one has to base one's identity on or rather one's understanding of yoga finally has to stem from one's own understanding and experience of it and if that experience is not taking us towards our vastness if that experience is not taking us towards the 
the the you know the greater amount of light in understanding in things then one knows for oneself that one is not on the path at the end of it it really boils down to a very simple thing these it's really just really simple whether what one is following or who one is following is not um making us more vaster more more enlarged than who we are in our present reality is one who's not making us more enlightened not just in terms of conceptual enlightened enlightenment but in terms of finding more peace because one sees the larger truth within the limited scope of things so yeah. if one is not on that way and if one is not the other very important a uh, litmus test for knowing whether the yoga that we are practicing is working or not is a more spontaneous sense of happiness if we are indeed sat chit and ananda and our practice is not making us more spontaneously happy not making us more simple aklishta then we don't need another after to tell us whether we are on the right path or not Sure. and if somebody else is taking us or you know trying to take us mislead us again it's very easy to be able to uh, come back to whether one is on the right path or not whether one has got misled or whether one is on the you know following that which is taking us on an authentic path of yoga so uh, dr anand is live with us and something that he is written in one of his comments i think it's very apt to this he says atma vichara is vital so when that starts happening that dissertion comes automatically yes. absolutely but also what uh, vinay ji talked yesterday and on the line agenda is a little is just mind boggling how the narratives are uh, distorted throughout so i think some awareness about that is also important because absolutely. sometimes innocent things we just given to this narrative so both ways i think absolutely absolutely but i think like like i said there are two ways of countering this one is to make your oneself equipped enough to understand so not have a naive position in life so it is important so dr vinay ji's talk yesterday was a brilliant um, you know brilliant exposition of the narratives the misleading narratives that as a yoga as a novice yoga practitioner or i even as a se- practitioner who's not exposed to alternatives needs to take into consideration so no doubt that has to be there but when will one be able to counter that effectively it is when one deepens one's own practice the more one deepens one's own practice one will be able to just by the very fact of one's existence counter any other narrative that might be presented by any other source so i think if as as a culture that has uh, that has seeded this practice of the yoga tradition and that has offered it uh, generously to the world without ever seeking to patent it without i mean the, the, all those ideas are contradictory to the very spirit of yoga it has made this a possibility available for everybody to connect with themselves so if one as a people also start becoming yogis in the true sense of the term rather than just practicing yoga and uh, you know a- acquiring a label which doesn't mean much and as you vinay ji yesterday was saying that the importance of sanskrit terms because it's important to recognize that these terms are not uh, arbitrary assignments these terms have very deep intrinsic meanings <clears throat> so a yogi is one who is in complete established in that alignment of what the spirit of yoga is and is not one who is on the mat trying for that one who is aspiring to become a, a realized person is not a yogi a yogi is already a realized person so when we throw around these terms yogi and yogini one has to just be sincere again to what one is claiming and what one is doing one can call oneself a yogi but considering that one is ready to put in that effort to live up to the term it's not the other way around that's the only thing so 
even as indians when we you know in india we are lucky that we have we've had living examples and we have ongoing living examples of true yogis who as a society we really uphold and uh, therefore we know the difference between ourselves and you know uh, what that stature is that stature is the yoga stature and therefore when we forget we as indians forget it and start calling ourselves yogi because we are 2 minutes on a mat i think one needs to just uh, i mean it's like the one of the biggest amnesias that one uh, faces unfortunately um magesh has a question uh, how an explorer can differentiate between the hallucinations and intuition they both arise from within yes um it's a it's a it's a tricky question because uh, one one definite feature of a hallucination is that it doesn't have a lasting impact and it gives a semblance of being true but when one starts implementing it it, it is not it is not aligned in terms of a a a, a larger sense or i would say larger sense but it doesn't have a sustainability about it is what i would say whereas when there is an intuition if one knows how to step back and watch it then one sees how it falls in place at various levels and intuition comes with such a certitude that it makes a lot of other things fall in place whereas a hallucination if one is sincere enough only gives us the semblance of feeling good there is a certain feel good about it rather than a genuine resolution at a multi at multiple layers of whatever problem that one is facing so i think one requires to it's not an easy easy distinction to make for someone who is a, a beginning on the path of yoga but i think if one understands the quality of intuition even conceptually if you have a great understanding of the quality of intuition then one will be one will know there is a certain knowing element in intuition that makes it irrefutable versus a, a hallucination this is possibly so, a simplistic answer to it because it is hard work so some i think it was long back some years back but we were in a in an ashram near narmada and uh, i think this was the question that i had asked one of the swamijis there uh, the same thing how what is the difference between what arises from within the intuition and hallucination and he had just to he's like if you have doubt then definitely it's a hallucination when it is intuition you will not have doubt about it so like you said it is something that is irrefutable so then there is no doubt then the question itself will not arise if it arises then maybe it is hallucination itself correct and hallucination also seems to have a quality of it's a fulfillment of a certain wish that you have you know so qualitatively it's quite different that you have a deep desire a longing or something and we almost conjure that to feel true in a hallucination yeah the mind really sort of you know makes up crystallizes the... it into a reality it sort of you know sort of materializes a deep longing into a reality uh, whereas an intuition sometimes need not be an easy thing a hallucination i think uh, i mean I, i i think i know i'm also aware that i might be oversimplifying this uh but uh, but i think it could also be like let's say if somebody wants to do uh, somebody is following a certain yoga path and they one would like to have certain realizations because i think uh, especially it's a feature of the modern age also this the need to have a result the need to have a palpable result especially in this age of grat you know quick gratifications it's something that we would like to believe has happened but if it's a mere hallucination it will not have a lasting impact and change at different levels whereas an intuition will have a qualitative change in your being also if you know how to perceive pursue it 
Uh, okay, Jeannie, again, I think in respect to her previous question of the yogic story, is it perfection or perfections, realization or realizations? Connected to my earlier question, is the pathway plural or there is only one path? No. So uh, there are, like we said, that uh, even this idea of the journey, so there are many paths, but uh, I mean, there are many, and it's for every individual to find their own path. So the Veda very clearly says there is Ritasya Panthaha. There are the paths of the right. And that right, that discovery of the Ritam is a very, very tricky, uh, tricky discovery, I would say, because it is dependent on multiple, multi layered factors that are happening. So there is really, at, literally, there is the Ritam of the moment. And that rhythm of the moment depends on the circumstances of the moment. So in order to in order to know that rightness of the moment, one has to be capable of being free of one's baggage of experiences that colors everything we do. So if one has to make a decision now, for example, we very typically tend to fall back on our experiences, tend to fall back on our preferences, dislikes, our conceptions of what will happen in the future. So we are working through multiple factors that govern our decisions. But in any given circumstance, I would say, in any given, given circumstance, there is the best option. It's the very law of the universe that in given circumstance, taking everything. So there is individual circumstance. There are, uh, you know, uh, community circumstance. There are so many circumstances. But if you put all of that together, there is a mathematical optimum that is there at every moment. And the true rhythm is about knowing that. Because if one knows that and acts upon that, then irrespective of what appears to be divergent, conflicting and all, the best will take place for everybody in the real sense of the term. Am I making yeah. sense? Yeah, Am I making absolutely. Sense? <laughs> absolutely. At least to me, it is like, wow. All right. So this Ritambhara Prajna that the Yoga Sutras talks about is when one is able to completely still all those noises of the vrittis then when one arrives at a station within a position when one can see through the vijnanamaya you know through the consciousness the higher levels of intelligence one can see that uh, mathematical optimum and one acts on it because one doesn't have a preference this way or that way one will do what has to be done because that is the best thing to be done and if that best thing is done then the best for everybody will happen yeah yeah so uh, whether there is one rhythm or many rhythms, I would say that there is a mathematical optimum. So there is one rhythm that should be there from my way of looking at it and with my limited understanding. There is one rhythm, uh, but there is a different rhythm for everybody. So there are multiple rhythms. My rhythm is not your rhythm. Everybody's rhythm is unique because the factors in everybody's lives are so unique. There are nature is just too smart she does not duplicate her efforts you know if we understand some of these uh, axioms of the yoga tradition if they're literally like they, they, these are these basic tenets then a lot of things start making sense quite automatically quite spontaneously yeah, I think so. What she's asking, there may be many rhythms, there may be many paths, but yours will be revealed unto you, and that is you and your path. That's about it. And you know, the beauty is that it is not that my rhythm now will be my rhythm tomorrow, and that's why it's such a hard thing to put out one's finger on. Yeah, and that's why, even while we are a prescriptive nation, we will say, even this idea of dharma. This idea of dharma is also, while it, there is a universal component, it is a dharma that is slightly molding itself with time as it moves. And that's why the dharma shastras were written for different ages. 
because the laws have changed the moods have changed the realities the vibrational qualities have changed so there cannot be one ideal for all times so that really keeps moving satyam satyam and that's why even the buddhist things they have the right thought the right thinking the right seeing you know that they, they, they have that uh, yeah. different following okay um arthur has another question thank you molly and dr anuradha you have studied so it's by you you have studied at uh, shri arvind international center what would you say is the difference between the yogic philosophy and the things of integral yoga and the yoga sutras i have seen some people who have some conflicts between them sometimes okay this is a much longer conversation <laughs> but uh, i think like I, i think if you take the uh if you take the la- the objective of the two yogas then one can understand the differences i mean none of them are exclusive again i would not say they are exclusive but there are they are slightly different paths and what they are attempting to achieve are slightly different within that larger commonness of goals okay so the yoga sutra like it defines its purpose in the very second sutra where it says yoga has chitta vritti nirodha so it is a practice a very systematic practice that will helps us to arrive at a point where one is no longer troubled by the movements of the mind and as a consequence the from the philosophy of the sankhya where you have two essential realities of the purusha the witness consciousness and the prakriti which is the consciousness of manifestation so with these two uh, con- these two es- essential realities when one allows the movements to cease then the witness consciousness is in himself drashtuhu swarupe avasthanam that we will be established in ourselves and then you achieve kaivalya which is that oneness of being now the objective of the integral yoga philosophy as the name itself suggests is not just realizing the oneness of one's essential reality with the witness consciousness which is almost like the most important first step is to achieve the stature uh, or the stature of the witness self is to act from that basis in life because it's never about the other life it's about acting in life the idea of moksha that i talked about you engage with life but untouched by the uh, movements of life so that samatva that that uh, experience of uh how would i put it that experience of going through without being or uh, that experience of vairagya through life that vairagya is very beautiful because it is the non coloring vairagya literally means the non coloring of oneself so how can we stay like that white light going through or you know that white or, or, i mean it's not that i'm you know there's a preference to white or something but that untainted self going through life's experiences with the fullness of life's experiences that was the beauty so if the integral yoga philosophy says that one needs to first achieve, achieve that and then one needs to not just be content by saying that i am that supreme self and where the body decays and dies where you know there is the emotions are not necessarily in place not just a realization but they say that that real, reality needs to then be brought into matter itself so the integral yoga philosophy has a very strong uh, focus about first experiencing the psychic consciousness within which is very close to the goal of the yoga sutra connecting with the purusha within and then allowing that purusha consciousness to manifest itself even in the physical cells of the body so the idea is that the cells of the body experience decay and death because the cells of the body are not aware of their inherent divinity so it is when one is able to not just mentally or emotionally know that i am that but the body it consciousness awakens to its own divinity then one will have physical transformation the material stuff will be divinized 
So it, it seeks a, an integral perfection of the being, which is also an idea of the Vedas when they talk of the fact that, you know, they talk, there is an idea of the seven headed rivers in the seven, uh, or seven headed truth in the seven waters. I won't complicate it more. But the idea that there is the Brahman quality, you see, maybe this will be easier to understand. The quality of Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda. At our, or rather in our lives, we do not experience our bodily reality, our emotional reality, our mental reality to express these qualities. We are in Asat, we are in uh, Achit or rather ignorance, uh, Avidya, and uh, we are very far from the Ananda part of it. So if we had to be moving Brahmans, what would that feel like? If the body, the body quality rather than, you know, because the Brahman is immortal, it is everything. If the body expresses that, then what would life be like? If our emotions, we live that such at an emotional level, what would our, what would our being be like? What would our mind be like? So the invitation of integral yoga is to find that Brahman in manifestation. Oh. Oh. Uh, Anandaji says in regards to the previous question, as Ammaji says, Dharma is doing the right thing for the right person in the right way at the right time. So very well said. Yes, thank you very much, Anandji. Thank you very much for being there. Okay, moving to the next question. Yes. To your point on our journey of life based on yogic teachings, how can we expedite our corrective measures to make up for the time lost as we have already made mistakes without this guidance? <laughs> no, so I think the first thing that the our yoga journey uh, uh, requires of us is to acquire a stance of non-judgmentalism. So how do we how do we look at reality without necessarily jumping into a judgment of that reality is the very first requirement of the yogic paths. And it's very interesting because the idea of judgment really springs from a subconscious notion that one knows what is right. So I think that first separation of what I think is right from what might actually be right is an important uh, recognition to have for oneself. Okay. So I, I possibly am saying that also uh, help us console ourselves that we have been living our lives, we have been trying our best uh, to whatever extent. I think none of us would consciously mislead ourselves. So I think that when we look back and see the journey that we've had, the best attitude in which to look at it is that there are certain forces, fortunately greater than us, that uh, are keepers of our story, of our life journey. And no matter how much we want to uh, get lost on the my way, okay, which is our narrowed understanding of life, they would help us to come back to the highway. Okay, so. Because you see, it's also the, there is a truth within again the truth that I spoke of that that Jata Vedas that Agni that Agni has taken on this birth for a very purpose of its own fulfillment. So there will always be a, a a hint to get back to get back to that truth. And whatever one does, uh, if one is able to reconnect to that truth, will uh, will be the right path. So if I have to. Again, simplify it. Like really, uh, when it comes to the bottom line for knowing whether what one is doing is on the right path or not, I think the the two cards that one plays, either it's a card of expansion or it's a card of contraction, either it's a card of light or it's a card of darkness. So behind all the complicated uh, notions and ideas that underlie different philosophies of life, what we are able to implement for ourselves, if it is making us a little broader, a little wider in our thoughts, if it is making us a little wider in our emotions, if it is making us a little 
feel broader in our actions, our capacities have increased, then one can feel assured that it is possibly on the it's probably on the right path. Because if one is doing something which is narrower, there's no way you will experience this this moment, this this experience of oh, it might be a tough decision at any point. But if that tough decision leads to a sense of oh, you know, like, yes, I've grown through that, then one can be sure that one is on the right path. It's not about an easy decision, it's also about a tough decision. And on the other side, uh, with the light and darkness, so if whatever our thought is in our relationships and whatever, if it has helped to bring more light, more peace, more harmony, uh, it has helped us to experience a little more oneness with ourselves, with our environment, then I guess that is the path. Like Sri Aurobindo says, all life is yoga. So it's not about, you know, now I'm going to practice yoga. It's about... What did I, how did I just speak to my maid? How did I, uh, how did I close the door? How did I, how did I eat my food? How did I, you know, how did I do the work I'm supposed to do? And there, therefore it becomes a very individual phenomenon. Yeah. This sincerity is at the end of the day, an individual, it's in the individual's hand. So the world can say, oh, what a great person, you know, how, how beautifully she speaks, how wonderfully she uh, she's doing things, she knows so much and all. But what would count for the individual is what you have really done the next moment. Even as I speak, what is the motivation behind how I utter my words? Is it a motivation that says, oh, I hope, you know, people will really appreciate and have a lot of likes and will spread it around. Is that the reason why I speak? Or is it I speak because this is, so far as I know, this is what I have seen. And as far as I know, I am not trying to mislead anybody in what I'm trying to share. And it's open for everybody to find what suits you in what I have shared. So to connect to your own truth. If that is what I, is, if that has been the intention behind, then possibly I have been able to be authentic in my aspiration to, uh, you know, to talk about this topic for the day. That's that's as much as I can say. What I will do later on can be in contradiction because I'm also a work in progress. Everybody's a work in progress. That's the other reassuring thing. <laughs> <laughs> Until yogi, yogi-ness has been achieved at all levels, we're all work in perfection. So not to worry, not to be judgmental about oneself, one, but to be watchful. To acquire the witness consciousness, to be watchful, to uh, step on the highway as much as one can rather than the my way. So I think next uh, one is not a question. There are a lot of beautiful comments, but I think I'll just read one of them. Santosh ji is uh, just expressing uh, best interpretation of Yoga Dharma ever heard. It is like hearing it directly from the creators of Veda. It has clarity about the path, practice and the goal. My sincere thanks for the divine lecture. Thank you very much, Santosh ji. Uh, Anuradhari, it is uh, 9 o'clock. There yes, are yes. one or two questions more. I uh, would like to want your permission. If you are okay, we can take them. Or yeah. If you have one or two questions, I can take them and close also. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Actually, this question you already answered while you were talking. Uh, Vedic Meer is the name they're asking. Uh, does yoga tradition has anything to do with any religion and caste? I think that's what you've already explained while you were talking. I, what I would just like to mention here, because the person has mentioned the word caste, and I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions that we have in our society today. The, uh, the misreading of the term caste really needs to be understood uh, by, by Indians if we want to do justice to even what the Vedas uh, referred to when they talked about it in the Purusha Sukta. So in the Purusha Sukta, you have the first time the reference of the term Varna and there is the, the description of the Purusha, the cosmic Purusha. And also it's important at this point because I was part of another conference where there were disc discussions about, you know, why does it have to be Purusha, a man? And why can it not be a woman? The problem with the modern lens is that it is so hyper-fragmented. 
that in the bargain it loses out on the truth of things and on the larger wisdom that underlies uh, realities so we need to really look beyond this fragmented lens of things so the word purusha and, and i'd love to clarify this because it's an important idea the word purusha like in many sanskrit terms is not determined by the gender of the object it is denoting the word purusha the gender of the term is dependent on the term itself so purusha when we talk of the cosmic purusha it is not the male that we are referring to it's not the male principle it's the cosmic being puri shete iti purusha in one whom that spirit resides okay so that and that can refer to not just the male female the other gender and everybody else so everybody is a purusha from a certain perspective you can have another limited sense of the purusha in the in the male context that also is there but the that cannot hijack the larger understanding of purusha as the cosmic being and that cosmic being has certain faculties so it's very important to understand that when that when creation started when that being manifested itself into becoming it acquired certain limited uh, manifestations because it did not manifest itself in its fullness it manifested parts of itself in existence that's why you are different i am different because we are all representing one part of that larger possibility and yoga is when this limited part of me dissolves into my larger possibility then i'm in yoga in the real sense of the term so when that large, when the purusha manifested itself the head of the purusha which has certain qualities the head in the human mind a human being also represents certain faculties so that became the brahmana the thinker the seer the uh, the you know the teacher so it had to do with the quality and the the action that they undertook rather than birth when the hands the hands have to do with management action it was a warrior you were the kshatriya the hands were the you know the the manager of things so that was the faculty of the hands the doer then you had the procreatory part that became the vaishya the the procreator the the creative aspects the the support aspects the creation that took place so the farmers anybody who the artists all the ones who were engaged in those professions belong to the vaishya category and then you had the shudra the shudra were those who would they would serve and it was a swabhava it was a nature so the varna was different from jati which is by birth now socio historically it happened that those who belong to a certain profession passed it on to their progeny which is something that is a phenomenon that we notice in today's world a doctor's child growing up with all the doctor terminologies all the medical terminologies has a natural propensity to become a doctor or a lawyer tends to become a lawyer because that's the atmosphere in which they are growing but as we see today that there a lawyer's child might choose that no that is not what my nature is i want to become an artist and that's when the person is actually following the varna from the jati that individual is making a shift to the varna they belong to what is your temperament and depending on the temperament you choose your vocation in life so one can be born in a doctor's family one can be born in a brahman family a teacher's family but if one has the propensity for managing then one becomes a kshatriya by very effort so the term caste is a huge misnomer that has overridden this distinction between the varna and the jati and the last thing the a beautiful angle that sri aurobindo brings to it he says that because every individual is a manifestation of the cosmic purusha it is important for every individual to incarnate to incarnate and manifest all the qualities of the purusha which means that if one is engaging in one's life one plays various roles so supposing you are playing the role of a teacher at that point one has to live up to the best teacher within oneself one has to be like the brahmana the same individual when you are let's say in a party and you have to manage things you have to exhibit the best qualities of the kshatriya become the best manager that you can be if one is engaging in a you know in a certain activity of creation or activity of exchange 
then one has to incarnate the best qualities of a shudra or oh, sorry of a vaishya and if one is at a position where one has been told to do something at that point one has to become the best shudra to serve in the way one is being asked to serve and not at that point say i am the manager and all because it will dis it will create an imbalance in that particular activity that is being proposed but if one has a kshatriya swabhava you know i am a manager it it is an effort it is a yoga to be able to step down in oneself and do what one is being asked to do it's not easy so in order to be the best brahmana the best vai uh, kshatriya the best vaishya the best shudra one has to be practicing yoga it has nothing to do with birth it has to do with understanding who i am koham what is my swabhava what is my propensity what is it that i will contribute in the best way possible so that's the first step so knowing oneself is again the you know the pin on which the all of life hinges so i hope i answered the question about varna and jati and caste <laughs> some except especially uh, today's time these things are coming up too much just, just because we sometimes just for the argument say or maybe lack of uh, understanding the larger context uh, dr anand is saying can we say varna is the entire spectrum of possibility and jati is the part of the spectrum where we choose to be <laughs> we choose as in the soul choice where the soul has chosen to be born to undergo a certain experience because jati has a certain uh, limitation of the physical birth one is bound by one's physical birth which could be the choice of the soul to have undertaken that uh, experience in life and that's where the mother from the shirobindu ashram where i grew up uh, she has this very powerful idea where she says that normally we look at ourselves as being victims of circumstances and we suffer a lot of suffering arises because we believe that we are victimized by our circumstances she says that if one turns it around and one knows that every birth is a choice that has been made to undergo a certain set of experiences in order to overcome our limitations of certain patterns of being then one will look at the challenges one encounters as opportunities to overcome that pattern rather than feeling victimized because one has forgotten that that particular circumstance was chosen by me in the first place and that circumstance comes as a homeopathic pill first so by every word every thought we are given the opportunity to overcome our limited patterns <clears throat> but we don't see it then it comes like an allopathic dose we don't see it it comes like an injection we don't see it it comes like you know it comes like a a, a surgery a surgery we don't see it it comes like a transplant and we don't see it we then pass on to the next life basically <laughs> and we start with square one <laughs> start everything with square one <laughs> so i think it's very important to uh, understand why we are here and work on that consciously at every moment the vedas doesn't give us a luxury of you know one day i will do they say that this yajna is a moment to moment thing so what we will achieve at the end of 10 steps will depend on what we took on the first step the direction we walked in the first step so we walk every step consciously is the invitation and just the last thing there and therefore in this time of the corona because i like like to connect it i think this is a huge awakening an opportunity for an awakening for mankind to collaborate to wake up to who we are rather than succumb to so all these natural disasters also are a reflection of the turmoil of the human species we are in such massive turmoil that nature is only reflecting us saying so there take it so the more we settle ourselves in the more yoga people are doing yoga either in the right way or the wrong way if at whatever the entry point might be just do it sincerely uh more and more in the spirit of yoga dharma i think i think a lot of the nature will settle down by herself sure. so then in uh, in context of what you explain with the varna and jati uh anand ji is saying that so then uh, karma bandha determines it 
also also because there is uh, the mother also talks of this she says that you know there are uh, uh, karmic bonds people take birth together in groups who have to work out collective karmas so there is the individual karma there is the family karma there is a community karma but karma being again nothing more than what i do creates a certain tendency which will create a certain result so if i'm born in a certain family and my parents behave in a certain way i there is a natural tendency for me to repeat that and i will i will experiences i will experience the consequences of that so i think that the real hope of the karma theory is the reminder that what i do next is in my hands i might have inherited whatever i have inherited whichever way i have inherited it but what i choose to do now will determine what what will happen tomorrow and what my child will witness about how parents can be or how or one can treat one's uh, one's uh, you know neighbors or how one can treat one's mates how one can treat everybody how do we treat each other the child who sees that today has a chance of emulating that tomorrow and i saw what my parents did and i have a tendency a propensity to repeat it but i have the choice now whether to repeat it or do it differently that freedom of choice is the greatest boon of the karma theory the epigenetics of choice that's what he is saying yeah yeah sure there is sure but i'm saying that the more conscious one becomes the more conscious one becomes i think the more one has the freedom of that choice one is empowered the more yogic we become in our uh, consciousness the more one is empowered with the choice of acting otherwise True. So that friction But that is there abuses gradually as you walk on the path. It's lesser and lesser every time. Yes, and also the fact that when Krishna uh, Krishna said nishkama karma, that you know if we can act with without our preferences, without our dislikes, if we can just act on the way that you have to act, then we don't get tied up by the consequences of. you know what i did because i like to do that because i might have had to go there but because i like to go there i would have gone there that time spent that petrol spent i have to that is that extra karmic baggage because that time and petrol spent has to be recovered that extra thing that i'm doing on this journey because like the vedas reminds us the journey is on whether we like it or not the journey is on at multiple levels simultaneously we are thinking we are talking we are acting so where are we headed is what we are uh, uh, what do you say we are uh, invited to contemplate upon thank you so yeah i again, think uh, yeah a very rich discussion uh, emerged i think this question answer session is a good part of it because some very nice perspectives come about and uh, graciously you just over short the time but uh, and i'm leaving one or two because they are completely on a different track that would uh, it's on the journey of uh, so pushpa ji were asking about the mantras um i would say that uh, anuradha ji you should uh, explore some of his videos where she's talking about that Uh, the question is, please guide us how mantra japa plays an important role in our journey. In just so, in two words, I can just say that in two words. So if, sure, you, sure. if one understands, if one understands that all of existence is nothing but vibrations, it's energy because it's energy is vibrations. Each one of us is a sum total of vibratory patterns of our body, of our emotions, of our mind, of our spirit. So the vibratory patterns of all of this is the sum total of who I am, which means it is a certain frequency, like. i can be reduced to a frequency like everything else in the world can be reduced to a frequency in a certain sense and therefore if i choose a mantra that uh, you know goes along with it then i enhance my own capacities so mananat trayate that constant remembrance of it because the source of it is beyond the human being so the source of the mantra is the cosmic vibration so the more i connect with that the more i enlarge myself the more i enlarge myself the more i am freed of my little 
uh, vibratory noises that vibratory noise is the source of disease and we have to align ourselves and experience ease and health and well being and peace right so the mantra can help us find that alignment is one thing and the mantra can unlock our potentials if you find the right mantra that matches our frequency you will lead an amplified life <laughs> <laughs> and if we are if we are out of sync with ourselves and all of that then the mantra will help us to align find alignments so it's uh, that's where it starts once you start aligning satya things satya. just start there was an interesting one manana trayate was one that which protects and manana tarayati that which takes us beyond there was another meaning that came out thru can have either protecting or that which takes us beyond so that can also be a possible meaning of mantra so it takes us beyond our smaller self to a larger reality of ourselves thank yeah. you pushpa ji i hope your question is answered <laughs> so now everybody is happy no no questions left so <laughs> Nice. I know, I know the temptation of not letting anybody's question go unanswered. <laughs> It just seems like okay, <laughs> but uh, thank you, thank you, Anuradhani, so thank much for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, we hope we will continue such sessions for all the viewers also who have joined us throughout the Bilwa. I think um, we went through a long journey. It started first with. establishing this sense of harmony in our own lives and uh, just to just to summarize the events uh, charvi ji explained the panchama yagyas for this and uh, like if you want to address what is going on around us we first need that inner uh, harmony um, otherwise like dr vinay ji said yesterday it just becomes like an emotional outburst or emotional activism and uh, that we need to be really careful when we are talking for yoga so we come need to come from that informed space within and then again the next session i think uh, in bilba uh, by shobhana ji she took us into exploring the niyama of swadhyaya and value education with uh, dr vijay uh with dr uh, vijay we then talked about uh, yoga as lifestyle medicine to keep us uh, healthy at all levels so that from there it becomes like a springboard for us to you know reach out to the heights or maybe depths within us and we understood in his, he very beautifully explained how spirituality in our day to day life is uh, it's not optional so if we seek an enriched living a holistic life at all levels is so so imperative uh, followed by dr uh, professor sharad ji sharad joshi he took us into this wonderful and holistic uh, view that integral yoga of uh, sri aurobindo offers us uh, so it was such a step by step journey that if you actually think through after he led us through that holistic integral perspective that's when yamuna ji came in and started an exploration to understand what is dharma what is yoga or what are, rather what is not yoga what is bharatiyata and uh, I, uh, her talk was very provocative in a way but also led us into realization of lot of things that she left us with uh, i mean after that is it was uh, me uh, and we try to unfold the path of shraddha and ishwara pranidana on this whole journey and how it is so important to connect to the higher or unlocking those higher potentials to be able to be on this path i think that by then had set a stage for uh, dr frolly to help us uh, see the vedic origins of yoga and uh, then of course uh, Dritya ji just touched the heart, the core of Sanatana Dharma, and how these uh, symbols and metaphors are so important to understand this inner path or inner journey. <laughs> After that, of course, I'm very sure none of you missed the wonderful session by Dr. Ashna, where he took the very theme of Bilva Festival of cultural appropriation and. Uh, he just took us to a to a, a very happening kind of a session and journey uh 
and uh, Vinayji. Uh, those who were there yesterday, you would know he actually uh, brought light to the idea of uh, Branti Darshanam and really opened our eyes through the principle of I mean, uh, Nisi, Nisi, what is happening around us and what is not yoga, what is not dharma. And finally, today, Anuradha ji uh, explained us that how if we can experience the ritha, the satya and the yoga that leads us towards this fullness or the purnata. So that, I think, brings about a full circle of what a journey it was. Again, I thank you all so much for joining us in this. And uh, Anuradha ji, so happy that you are here in the concluding session of Bilba. Looking forward to have you next year as well. <laughs> so, various, uh, maybe the mantra aspect. And you are such a wonderful teacher. I have seen through my explorations about you. But uh, yeah, it's an invite right away. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to, if you, with your permission, maybe we can do a mantra to close. Just a simple, let's say, Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu. I think that's something that we need to invoke. So whatever, whichever way you want to start, you want to lead it, whatever way, I'm happy to do that. All yours, all yours. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you once again for this opportunity. And I'd like to thank all our participants. I'd like to especially thank Ananji for being there and for sharing his very insightful comments on uh, the answers that were given and also questions. And uh, to all the participants, thank you very much for uh, staying, uh, staying on with the session and uh, welcome you again to take part in this journey of yoga dharma. So shine the light within. I think that's the message. Uh, and all the darkness shall fall away automatically. <laughs> so we can do. Uh, uh, Loka Samastha Sukhima Bhavantu. Definitely. Om Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu. Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu. Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you.